I am Pastor Karis, and this is, I mean, I don't usually, um, I'm the children's pastor, so I'm usually upstairs with the kids uh, trying to control the chaos, but <laughs> today, uh, and I'm like, wow, this is like unusual for me to be here uh, in the service for like once a month even, so this is so nice to, to just be with you all. Um, can, babe, can I get a stand, please, for my... Thank you. All right. Well, um, today we are kind of like on a part two. Last week, Pastor Ron, he spoke, um, shared a lot from his life of strongholds that he has overcome through the power of the Holy Spirit and, um, and was very, very vulnerable with all of us on something that we, many of us, especially here in Hawaii, that we are familiar with, and that is the stronghold of shame. And he really shared on it, and I, I feel like God is really about to do an amazing thing in all of us. Now, it's crazy because I'm like, okay, here we are in February, and um, we are actually about to embark on what the Christians call Lent. All right, and so Lent is 40 days leading up to Easter, right? Our Super Bowl Sunday, the big day for why we are even here when Jesus went to the cross and took down sin and death. And, and so these 40 days leading up to Easter, it's what we call Ash Wednesday. Now, our church isn't very like liturgical and all of those, we don't necessarily follow that but it is a really awesome tradition um, of doing this, this of uh, doing Lent. And so Ash Wednesday, which is 40 days before, begins this Wednesday, okay, on the 23rd. Is that right? <laughs> I can't even. 22nd, don't start on Thursday. The 22nd is when um, our 40 days is gonna begin. And it actually won't take us exactly to Easter, it'll take us to the Sunday before Easter, all right, which we call Palm Sunday, which is when we celebrate when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and everybody was laying down their, their coats and praising him, all right? so. That's what we're gonna be talking about today is leading up to that, we want to give you an opportunity to experience something that I'm gonna just say it, it will be challenging, it will be difficult at times, but this could be a major life and game changer for you, no matter where you are in life. And so as we talk about strongholds, I'm going to just, I mean, Pastor Ron did a great job teaching on it. I'm going to do a little bit of overview of it, um, just in case you missed it or you just need kind of a refresher on it. But <clears throat> I did want to start with the why. This is just how I'm wired. I always want to know the purpose behind what we're doing. I'm never one to just want to do something just to do it. We got to know the why. <clears throat> And because we're gonna be talking about breaking strongholds, overcoming strongholds for 40 days, it's gonna, like I said, it's gonna be challenging. And I am gonna ask you to fast, all right? Uh, to give up something. And, and why do we say this? Is it because we just love to see you in pain? We're just sadists and we're like, if we're gonna suffer, you're gonna suffer with us. No, absolutely not. Th that is not the why behind it. And it's not that, and God doesn't want that. He doesn't call us to, to walk through these painful things, to break strongholds or to go through a fast just because he likes to see us in pain. No, no. What he sees is the healing and the breakthrough that is on the other side. He sees that the things that you look at in your life, that you're like, this can and never will ever, ever change in me, he says, mm -mm, no, there's more. I see healing in you. I see freedom in you. I see victory in you. That is what he is seeing. And it's in the same way I liken it to like when we have, when you have a kid, when you have a child, like when Alora, when she's gonna start walking, 
right? It's like you're looking at this little one and everything in you knows you can do it. And they get up and they're kind of like toddling around and they fall down. What do we say? It's okay. You can do it. We can see what they cannot see. We can see that they're going to be able to do this. It may not be today, and that's okay, but every step counts. And that is what we're doing with these 40 days of overcoming strongholds. It's the father looking at us and saying, it's okay. You can do it. Get up again. You can do it. You're going to walk. That is what the father's doing. And that is what these 40 days is about. So, um, like what Pastor Ron shared last week, I'm going to just quickly go through it. This is all taken from Dr. Ed Sovoso's course, which we just talked about, the Ecclesia Accelerator. If you want to get the full teaching on that, even just the full course, I really encourage you to take it. This really is one of the greatest tools for learning how to be a disciple of Jesus and make disciples of Jesus. That, to me, in its essence, is what the Ecclesia Accelerator is about. So um, the three weapons that the enemy uses against us, because you are, were all given from even before you were a thought, the Lord put a destiny on each of your lives. You all have a destiny to glorify God, to partner with him to bring his kingdom of heaven here on earth. And so the enemy hates that. And so he uses three weapons against us. And the first one that Ed talks about is sin, right? And sin is, a very, is very active. It seeks you out like a guided missile is what he says. And when it hits you, you know it because like it says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. You will feel it. That is one of the weapons that the enemy uses against us to take us off course, to steal, kill, and destroy who God destined us to be. The second is accusations. He's called, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. And so this one is more passive. It's a trap that's waiting for you to fall into it. This is another weapon that the enemy uses against you. And it's the, the whispers in your ear of <clears throat> remember when you did that, you should feel ashamed of yourself. And not only is it the accusations of what you did and that Jesus, Jesus' sacrifice doesn't cover that, it's also <clears throat> saying that the, the things that you could commit, he's accusing you of that. Okay, this is the second weapon that the enemy uses against us, but the third weapon is the sneaky one, and that is the strongholds. This is the third weapon that the enemy uses against us, and it is, it's sneaky because it's dormant. And I did a little, re very, very little researching, like YouTube kind of researching, on <laughs> underwater mines, and it's so fascinating because you, there's, from World War I, World War II, they had these underwater mines that even to this day, there are some that they're still trying to dismantle. And it's, but they're temporarily inactive. And, and they're just left to wait for activation. And the enemy uses this against us. And what it is, is that we're totally unaware of it. You could be having a great life, you feel like everything is working out. It's finally going well for you. Things are all falling into place. And all of a sudden, you get triggered and boom, there's an explosion. Strongholds. It's connected to strongholds. And, and what, what I learned was before World War II, the mines could only detonate upon contact. Well, after that, they invented, or during World War II, they invented the influence mines. And with these mines, they could be activated by magnetic, acoustic, or pressure changes in the water. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that happen to us? When life's pressures start to hit, all of a sudden, we have a lot of trigger buttons. 
and now I am losing it with my kids. Now I have no grace for my, all the, the, the relationships that are most important to me. It's, we get triggered, and now there's these explosions. There's strongholds in our lives that we don't necessarily see. It's not active, it's not passive. They're dormant, just waiting, just waiting for it to be triggered. So <clears throat> Ed Savoso says this, and Pastor Ron talked about it. A stronghold is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that forces us to accept as unchangeable situations we know are contrary to the will of God. This is my interpretation of what Ed is saying, because Ed is brilliant. <laughs> and a lot of things I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> This is my interpretation of it, of Ed's definition. A stronghold is when there is a disconnect between my mind, what I know to be true, and my heart, what I believe to be true. And I love this, um, Pastor Scotty added this on, and my actions. Sometimes we don't even know it, right? But it comes out sideways through our actions. And it's all disconnected. We can say it because we know it. I know that God is for me. I know that God will never leave me. But my actions don't show it. My actions show that I am living in fear. And I am so fearful of everybody rejecting me. Why? Because there is this deep stronghold in me that fears rejection. There's a stronghold in me that says, you are not lovable. So our actions show it, and it is laced with hopelessness. Therefore, we believe that things can and will never change. And again, it's dormant. There's so many things in us we don't even know are there until it gets triggered. All right, so uh, we're gonna, uh, here's just a, a graphic that I found that I felt like perfectly illustrates this, the heart and mind disconnect. When your heart believes one thing and your mind believes another, there is that disconnect. So we're gonna look at the five characteristics of a stronghold. Again, this will go way more in depth in the accelerator, um, but I'm just gonna briefly touch on it. All right, so number one, as Pastor Ron said, they are located in the mind. Therefore, we must renew our minds and continue to renew our minds. It's like a subscription that needs to be renewed, right? We need to actively renew this in our mind. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. All right, so... Um, <clears throat> the devil attacks the mind. He can't read your thoughts because he is not omniscient. Only God is omniscient, which means all-knowing. The enemy doesn't, cannot read your thoughts. And, but he plants thoughts. And I wanted to share this. I remember years ago, um, we had a pastor here who um, is pastoring another church. His name is Pastor Dean Fujishima. He is at Unified Church right now. And... I remember him sharing this illustration of what the enemy does. And it's, he, said, he said, the enemy cannot read your thoughts because he's not omniscient. But he said, if someone were to put a camera on you 24-7 and watched everything that you did, I'm pretty sure people would know all of your struggles. <laughs> right? You could kind of get a good guess of that. And the same thing is true with the enemy. He can't know your thoughts. He's not God. But there's ways that he can kind of guess, you know. And it's, it's, the, it's the underwater minds. Let me just plant this. Let me just plant this. And we'll see if this one takes. We'll see if this one takes. He plants things in our minds and in our hearts. And so he's not omniscient. But, and what I, the way I look at it, too, it's like he knows your algorithm, Right? <laughs> He knows your algorithm better than anybody else. And so he knows how to try to trip you up. All right, so they're located in the mind, which is why we need to renew our minds daily. All right, they're made up of good thoughts and intentions. And 
What I wanted to share about this, what does this mean? It's, um, let me just give you an example. It's maybe you have, like you have beef with somebody, you have a conflict with somebody, and you're, you know you're gonna see them at work, and, and you're like, I'm just gonna settle for being cordial with them. I'm not ready to forgive them, they don't deserve it, but I'll just settle for being cordial and polite. It's a good intention, it's a good thought, but it keeps us stuck. Another one could be where it's like with, um, say it is with, uh, with your children, and, and we hear this all the time, they have it way better than I ever had. Yeah, yeah, I lose my temper. Yeah, they, you know, all of this, you know, I, I'm not the best at this. But you know what? They got it way better than I had it. It's a good thought, and it's a good intention. But it keeps us in our stronghold. All right, number three is they develop in the shadow of our strengths. Okay, Pastor Ron talked about shame, Right? How in him being full Japanese, he struggles with this, this area of shame. Like I said, a lot of us local people, we all struggle with that, right? I was just explaining to a friend who didn't grow up here, who's not Japanese. I said, do you understand that everything I do filters through shame? She's like, what? I go, let me just give you an example, okay? I said, I remember, if you just stop to break it down, you're gonna see how it all connects. So I was telling her, I said, you know, I, I went to go volunteer at Moanalo Elementary, and as I'm walking there, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go shishi, I have to use the bathroom. But I'm like, I'm already late, and I gotta get to the classroom that I'm helping at. And so I think to myself, I'm not gonna tell her I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm just gonna hold it. Why? Because shame. Why is that shame? I don't know. I don't, it's, and it's, I'm like, I don't want to inconvenience them because that's going to make me feel shame. Everything I do filters through this. Just for a second, look at everything you do and just break it down. You're going to see how it connects. It's crazy. But they develop in the shadow of our strength. So he talked about shame. Did you know that Japan is ranked the 10th safest place in the world according to the Global Peace Index. The USA, 129th. <laughs> and you know what it actually says? I was looking up this report in the Global Peace Index. It says it's because Japan has a culture of respecting and honoring people. And they don't wanna make shame, right? I have not, I've only been to the airport of Japan, but I've heard that you cannot even eat on the street, right? When you're walking on the sidewalks because you're gonna inconvenience people. They don't even have trash cans, right, around because it's like that might inconvenience people. So it's such a strength, right? What a beautiful thing that you have a people that is constantly thinking about everybody else. It's a strength. It results in a safe place. <laughs> but there is so much bondage and isolation. Why? Because, and Pastor Daniel talked about this at the end of service last week. Because if it's associated, that in itself is good. But if that is associated with the fear of being judged by others, bondage, isolation, now you're stuck. All right, so that's our, our third characteristic of a stronghold. The fourth one is they are activated by trauma and detonated by crisis. A lot of our strongholds are connected to this. And we talk about um, ACEs, right? Adverse childhood experiences. This, this is not just a Christian thing, right? This is like science. This is, and it's, it, there's three types 
of aces. There's, when, there, when you grow up and your childhood is filled with abuse, whether physical, emotional, sexual, neglect, or there's, if it's physical or emotional, or there's household dysfunction, if there was mental illness in the home, if there was an incarcerated relative, if there was abuse toward a parent that you saw, if there was substance abuse, and if there was divorce. When we look at these, the, uh, these characteristics of our adverse childhood experiences, we look at statistics of if 50% of married couples end in divorce, that means one out of two people is walking around with aces. And you know what? And it is through these kinds of traumatic things that strongholds get planted. It's what makes us feel hopeless. It's what makes us feel like this can and never will change. And I wanted to look it up, like what is trauma? What is childhood trauma? According to the National Institute of Mental Health, childhood trauma is defined as the experience of an event by a child that is emotionally painful or distressful, which often results in lasting mental and physical effects. It's emotionally painful or distressful. So basically, there's really no set definition of it because it is according to that child's experience and perspective. So as an adult, it's easy to be like, ah, that was nothing. As an adult, we look at it like, that was, I don't know why I made that such a big deal. I don't know why in my mind that's so shameful or so painful. It's probably because there's some trauma attached to it. That's our fourth characteristic of a stronghold. And then fifthly is they create a double mind that results in emotional and spiritual instability. Do you feel like your walk with God is constantly a roller coaster? You're high, then you're low. You're up, you're down. You're all over the place. There is emotional and spiritual instability because of our strongholds. And it is hard. It's hard to see all these things because I know for myself, I can relate to all these things, right? But the awesome thing is what we're doing is we're going to be overcoming these strongholds, all right? And so how do we demolish strongholds? How do we destroy these strongholds? Because like I said, the Father is looking at you saying, I know you're going to walk. I kn- Get up. You're going to do it again. He's not mad at you for falling. He just says, it's okay, try again. Try again. All right, so how do we destroy strongholds? Number one is perseverance is the key. All right, and I'm not going to say, this is not a, a magical formula. There's no, unfortunately, there's no, like, special pill that we can take for this. It's going to require perseverance, It requires us to lean into the pain sometimes. I remember talking to um, one of the young adults, and she's a a nurse. And I said, when when you look at someone that is, like, in recovery, or or they've been, or say, like, even a burn victim, isn't it that they have to go through more pain before they start to see healing? And she's like, yeah. And and that's what this is, right, Is, is... It's scary, and it's because there's pain behind our strongholds. So you have to persevere. You've got to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus to see what he is seeing. And um, because here's the, uh, and then it's the 40-day treatment. All right, I'm going to get more into that in just a little bit. But in Matthew 5, 6, Jesus says this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's what perseverance does. It's, it causes this hungering and thirsting within our hearts for righteousness. Are you hungering for righteousness? Because you know what righteousness is? Righteousness is when I feel that it is right between me and God. There are no barriers. Righteousness is when I know it is right between you and me. 
There are no barriers. I'm longing for righteousness. I'm longing for more of that in my life between God and myself and me and others. That's what righteousness is. But God is a gentleman. He may see it, but he's never going to force you. He's, never condemn, he's not going to condemn you. He'll just wait till you're ready. And when you're ready, he will meet you every time. Every time. He promises that, that he will satisfy our hungering and our thirsting for it. That is a promise. And in James 4, 8, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Again, a promise. He's not going to turn away. He's not going to just be like, he's not going to tease you. He will draw near to you. He will be so close to you. We have to persevere. And one of the other things that I forgot to mention that is really key if you're going to choose to embark on these 40 days is to have a prayer partner, to have someone that you can dialogue about these things with, that will pray for you, that will pray with you. If it is your spouse, it's easy to be like, okay, it'll just be my husband, it'll be my wife. you got to be intentional with it. It's easy to be like, okay, yeah, make sure you're praying for me now. But, but we don't do anything about it. You have to intentionally be coming together on a, at least a weekly basis to go, okay, what is God showing you? What's going on? How can I pray for you? Okay, you have to be intentional about it. But honestly, to me, this is one of the, that's one of the secrets to the persevering, is to have someone with you running with you praying with you, encouraging you. When it gets hard and you feel like I'm getting nothing, you can get that prayer partner to be like, okay, well, this is what I see God doing. All right, get a prayer partner. That's how you persevere. And then with the 40-day treatment, so we have available for you um, this booklet. It's just a mini booklet to help walk, help you walk through overcoming strongholds. And I just wanted to share about this. So the Lord had put this on my heart to put together um, about a year ago when we were doing We Are the Ecclesia, I think. And, um, and God put this on my heart to do it because at the time, my, one of, my mentor, um, Tisha Layfelt, uh, she was doing like a sugar fast, and she was doing this book by Wendy Speak, which was awesome. And she approached my girlfriends and I, and she said, uh, would you guys do this 40-day sugar fast with me? And I was like, no, no, no. I, 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 was like, I don't want to. I was like, no, Tish, you know I love sugar. And it was, it was so hard. And, but we went through this book, and I just loved this book. If you're looking at doing a sugar fast, look up. This book by Wendy Speak is awesome. But what I loved about it was it was an everyday, like, devotional. It gave, like, a two- to three-page devotional every day that you would read. And we would meet up once a week to talk over FaceTime and just share what God was showing us. And it was the most fruitful fast I had ever been on. And the most consistent, if I'm just going to be totally honest with you, it was the most consistent. Why? Because there was accountability and there was this material that was helping me through it. And so after I went through it, um, the Lord told me, he said, Karis, I have gifted you to be an exhorter. You're an encourager. That's who you are. On top of that, you have a pastor's gift, not just pastor as in my vocation, but a pastor according to like the fivefold ministry of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And he said, you have a pastor's gift. You need to do this devotional because it's going to help people to walk it out, to experience breakthrough. So I did what I always do, and I procrastinated, and I just... <laughs> That was at the beginning of the year. And then we were, did the Ecclesia Accelerator in the fall. And here we are about to do the 40 days of breaking strongholds. And I was like, oh, I didn't do it. And so, so one day I'm doing my spa and it was the, the verses. We were in Acts 
And it was talking about Barnabas. And Barnabas' name means son of encouragement. And the Lord says, Caris, you are a daughter of encouragement. You need to do this. And, and this was all around the time that we were planning Fall Fest. Okay, our biggest outreach, it was leading up to Fall Fest, and I am crazy busy with details like galore. And the Lord tells me, I want you to take this whole day and work on this booklet, and I promise you I will provide for Fall Fest. So I was like, all right. At that point, I had, I had written like three different drafts of how this devotional was going to go. I kid you not. And nothing felt right. And as I sat there, the Holy Spirit says, just starts leading me. And he says, don't feel like you have to write anything. Just use scripture. <laughs> and so what I started to look up where I, it, these, this booklet is full of 40 days of God's promises. These are all truths. It is 40 days of that. And what he led me to do was in my shepherding gift, of pastoring gift, some days I just kind of wrote out things to help you walk, like process through stuff, all right? To look, to think deeper, to pray deeper into this verse and the stronghold that might be attached to it, all right? So it's very simple, but it's going to help to give you that accountability and to work through it. And so here are some essentials for doing our 40 days starting on Wednesday, all right? All right, number one is write down key Bible verses. Take time to ask God to highlight verses to you. If you don't know any verses, just Google it. I do it all the time. All right, so if it's like God, um, you know, wanting to find a verse on his unconditional love, just Google that. Bible verse on un God's unconditional love. That's it. A whole bunch will pop up. As you look through it, just see the ones that really jump out to you. Claim those as your key verses. All right, and then say and even memorize these verses over these next 40 days. And what Ed Savoso says is say them, not just every day, say them four times a day. <laughs> Let it become so ingrained, not just in your heart, or in your head, but in your heart. Okay? Key Bible verses. So that's the first thing for our essentials. Number two is write out declarations from the truth he reveals and say them out loud until your head connects to your heart. So these are some of the ones like I even did myself. I declare that I am loved 100% of the time. I declare that I am loved without conditions. I declare that I am seen. Okay, write out de these declarations and say this. Um, I gotta share this about Shira, it was so awesome. Last accelerator that we did. She had so many Bible verses. How many Bible verses did you have? Too many. So what she did was she recorded herself saying it on her phone, and then she would play it over herself four times a day. She'd be driving in her car. What I was like, that is so awesome. You can take that. Right, Shira? They can take that. Record, record yourself saying your verses and your declarations and, say, and have it so that you can do it consistently. Thirdly, and essential for our 40 days is focus on having heart-to-heart -heart connections with him every day. For me, one of the easiest ways for my heart to connect with the Father is through worship. Every morning when I'm getting ready, I'm trying to, I just want to like get my heart right, partner with the Holy Spirit, just listen to worship music. Let your heart connect to his every day. This is so important. Fourthly, even on days when you are not getting anything quote unquote significant, okay, there's days, I'll be honest with you, myself as a pastor, <laughs> there are days when I am reading the scriptures and I'm sitting down going, huh, I don't got anything today. <laughs> Lord, what are you saying? You know, I, I can't hear it. And I'm not getting anything significant. Or some days it's just like, He's just reminding me again, Karis, I love you. Do you know how much I love you? 
It's meaningful, but you know what? It's not that significant. I know he loves me, right? But even on those days, push through and enjoy. Just enjoy it. Enjoy his love. Enjoy being in his presence. That's it, all right? But don't feel like, ah, it's just a wash. No, he's still meeting you in those moments, all right? And then fifth is keep spying. So here at our church, we do something called SPA, and what it stands for is scripture. You read the scripture, and we do have a daily reading. It's very, very doable. If you're feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't have time, you have time, all right? It is like literally like six or so verses a day. You can get, I think we have bookmarks in the back, but there's a scripture reading for every day. So what SPA is, you read the scripture, The P stands for prophetic word. And this is where you ask the Father to show you what are you saying to me through this. All right, and you have him speak to you. And then the A is the application, is is he's going to want you to do something with it. So keep doing this every day, doing, you know, reading the word, journaling, because honestly, it is, I kid you not, this happens every time for me, it will always connect with what God is doing in you. So if you're doing the devotional booklet along with the spa booklet, uh, the daily reading, there is, it's crazy how God begins to weave it all together. You'll see that, all right? And then the last thing, um, and I'm wrapping up already, but the last thing is to fast. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I got two more. Just kidding. Fast for 40 days, all right? And, um, I know, if you're like me, just cringing already, like, no, 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 don't, 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 don't. But I will say this, there is something very spiritual to fasting, all right? Again, God is not a sadist. He is not just wanting you to suffer. He is not enjoying seeing you suffer and go through pain. No, there is something significant that when we hunger and thirst for him, he will satisfy Okay, and um, did I write it? Sorry, nope, wrong one. Um, And and so, but the other thing I do want to say about the fasting is, oh, sorry, fast for 40 days, but don't make it about the fast. Okay, fast, but, and, and I will admit this. I remember years ago when our church did a Daniel fast for the first time. How many of you guys remember that, doing the Daniel fast, all right? We all suffered together, right? But along with that, it was like, oh, we see each other at Down to Earth, at Whole Foods, right? It was all about that. And I got to be honest with you. For us, the fast became about, oh my gosh, how many almonds did I eat? Did I eat already? I just gotta, I just gotta eat something. Oh my gosh, look, the caffeine withdrawals, the caffeine, I miss, I miss coffee. Like it was just, it was more about that. It was like planning out my meal. Like, okay, tonight I'm gonna make quinoa and, and vegetables and, and tofu, right? It just became about recipes and let's share our recipes and peanut butter balls, right? It was just about it's the fast. And it, it was very overwhelming, right? And then I'm like, oh, I barely had time to like sit at the Lord's feet and read my Bible. Why? Because I got to go shopping again and spend $300 on organic food. Like it was, it was just crazy. So we're past those days. Everybody say praise God. <laughs> we're past those days. We're not going to do that. But I will encourage you to fast something. But if it's going to trip you up, because it becomes more about the fast and what you can and cannot eat or can and cannot watch, don't worry about it. All right, just do 40 days. But I will say, you know, there is something to it, um, whether it's fasting from sugars, whether it's, um, I think Pastor Ron's going to do a full-on liquid fast. Um, I, Marion, my husband, Pastor Marion, um, he, I didn't even ask him for permission, but he, the, what he fasted last year um, during the accelerator was he is addicted to looking at real estate. Anyone else here? Yeah, yes. Addicted, all right? The boys, our boys know, like he, like, oh, daddy's sitting in his favorite chair in the nothing box looking at houses. Like that, they will literally say that. 
so the Lord led him to fast Zillow and Redfin and all the real estate apps and websites that he was looking at. Oh, okay, there we go, thank you. <laughs> Let's do it. So, so whatever it is that God is leading you to fast from, it's up to you. It's between you and God. We're not gonna hold you to it. Again, this is between you and the Lord and what it, whatever it is that he's wanting you to give up. And um, you will see, though, that he will satisfy you. He will bring the satisfaction in you that you're hungering for, okay? All right, and then lastly, this is one of the keys is <clears throat> to the 40-day treatment is you're gonna be doing a lot of forgiving and asking for forgiveness, but this is the secret weapon. This is all we got, right? Revenge doesn't work. When someone hurts us, and we want them to hurt the way we hurt, it doesn't work. It doesn't take away the pain. Forgiveness is the only thing we got. And if you can remember, like I was breaking down the characteristics of a stronghold, where they are attached to trauma, it's attached to pain. There's gonna be a lot of people in our lives that we have to forgive. And, and what I wanna encourage you is as, especially for the adults in here, it's easy to filter it through being an adult and saying, oh, that, but that was, that was when I was six years old. Like, ah, oh, I, I know they had good intentions. I know they didn't mean to hurt me. I know that, that, that there were other things happening. So that's okay, that's okay. Time does not heal all wounds. Our hearts remember, and it requires us to go back to those places to get set free. And so it may be where, and I'll share from my journey in a little bit, but it may be where as you are, are reading these scriptures, and um, you know, there's some, I give some questions like, uh, where, uh, are there times that you can remember of feeling alone, of feeling lonely? Those kinds of things, if you allow the Holy Spirit, he'll bring it up. But the thing is, you don't have to just let it come to the surface and then not do anything about it. The Lord is bringing it up so that he can bring healing to that pain and take it away. But he can't bring healing if we don't allow him to bring it up. We have to have the humility to be able to allow him to do it. So you're going to be forgiving a lot of people. But there's also going to, there's also going to be times where you're going to have to ask the Lord for forgiveness as well. Jesus says this. He says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And what Jesus is saying here is he's, it's not a threat. It's not like he's saying like, oh, don't do it. Don't judge or else this is what's gonna happen to you. You know, like, oh, don't jump off of that. You're gonna have to go to the hospital, right? Like we tell our kids. It's not like a threat like that. It's, he's just describing a law. Okay, it's like the law of gravity. What goes up must come down, right? We cannot change that. It's a law in the universe. Jesus was describing a law that is in the universe. That when we judge someone else, and a judgment is usually like, like this. I'm going to just share with you. It's like, I would never do that if I was that person, right? And it could be out loud or it could be in our hearts. How can that person possibly dot, dot, dot? When we make judgments, like if I, was, if I was in that person's shoes, I would never, I would always, whatever it is, we make these judgments in our hearts. 
And, and what Jesus says is the law that goes with judgment is when you judge, you will also be judged according to the measure that you judged. And so now, because I judged this leader according to what I saw as whatever, what should happen, now people are going to start to judge me according to that measure. But you know what is even harder than other people? It's we do it to ourselves. Now, the judgment that I made against someone else I now feel that judgment against myself. And so if I made a judgment against this leader, for me, I'm going to be like, I, I never want to be a leader. I never want to be in that position. Either that or we end up doing the very things that we judged. So what we have to do is dismantle these judgments. We have to ask the Lord for forgiveness for the judgments that we made in our hearts so that it cancels that. Forgiveness is the only thing that is gonna fix that because it's only by the blood of Jesus. We cannot do it on our own. It is only through the blood and the forgiveness of Jesus. So, um, so that is a, a gonna be a, a key essential for your 40 days. Is, is forgiveness. And uh, I was just telling Marion, because I was looking through my old journals um, from when we first did the accelerator, or not first, but one of the early times we did the accelerator. And what the Lord had brought up in me was I realized, and um, what's funny is we'd started doing premarital counseling with Chris and Lauren, and yesterday we were talking about like myths of marriage, you know, and one of the myths of marriage is that marriage is a 50-50 thing. Well, I realized in me, uh, this is just even a couple years ago, I still had that myth of 50-50 in me. Why? Because every time I was like, ooh, I am washing the dishes for the third night in a row, he didn't even notice. Or every time Marion had um, Air Force training, right? He's in the Air Force Reserves. And a training would come up. And he'd be like, oh, so sorry. I, I got to go to this training um, tomorrow night. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> and you know how I mask it? You didn't even tell me. You didn't, you didn't tell me when we're putting the calendar together. <laughs> but there was, within me was a scorecard. Within me was this whole, this stronghold of it's 50-50. So I'm keeping tabs on everything because I'm going to do 50% and you got to do 50%. And you know what? It's so funny because I'm telling him I'm reading through what I'm journaling to the Lord and I'm very honest with God, right? And I'm like, I told him, oh, I was like writing all about you. Like, oh, Marion, he like did this, you know? <laughs> And, but I said, you know what's crazy is I look at this and I don't feel it anymore because God took me through this. It's so crazy. But I will tell you the journey that, that it took was it was dealing with things from my childhood. You know, and I had a great childhood. <laughs> I had a great childhood, but still there were things from my perspective that were still unfinished, and there were still points of pain in me. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and there were, there were things like, uh, I was telling this to Alexa, my niece, Daniel and Erin's daughter. I was telling her about one time how I, when I was a little girl, and my dad used to take my brother's to go in the stream. We lived right here where we live right now. We, and they would go in the stream and, and I would write notes to my dad. My mom kept all these notes. And I was probably like five or six years old and I would write these notes to my dad and I'd say like, dear dad, I hate you, love Karis. <laughs> And then, I, and then I would like slip it under the door, you know, and, and there's lots of these notes. I would just like go in my room, like write these notes. Dear dad, I'm so mad at you. I hate you. Love cars. And then, you know, because it's like, 
<laughs> you know, that's the only way I knew how to write notes, right? But you know what's so funny is I would do that and then I'd feel better after. It's like I just had to get off my chest and then I would play in my room, you know? But, but I was telling Alexa this and she was like, she goes, why did Abba do that? Like all she heard, I'm telling her the, to tell her the funny story about the notes. She's like, why didn't he take you? Why didn't he take you into the stream as well? <laughs> And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it was things like that that the Lord just started to, to highlight in me that behind the 50-50 the lie was there's not enough love for me. So now everything I do operates out of that, out of the fear that there's not going to be enough love for me. This stronghold takes a hold of my heart, and now that's what I'm operating out of, and I don't even know it. And how did it come out? It came out against my husband. <laughs> because everything I did was, I hope that you can love me more than, than I think you're capable of, more than I think I'm capable, or that I'm lovable. I hope you can love me. And so it was going back to places like that, that, you know, even some of it, there wasn't a lot of emotion, but it's just like, okay, Lord, if, if that's part of the lie that the enemy brought into my heart, then I'm going to just do it. And I would just forgive and, and let it go and, and give it to the Lord. And another thing that God would do was he would, he would affirm things in me. Like, he'd be like, Karis, I know I've wired you to be a planner, I've wired you to want to have organization and all of that. So when Marion springs stuff on you, it feels like a personal thing, but it's not. And it was me having to deal, deal with my expectations of if this is how I live my life and how I organize my life, I am expecting him to do the same when God hasn't wired him that way. And God would take me down that path of just saying, oh, oh my gosh, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me for my critical heart. Please forgive me for my judgments, for my judgmental spirit and attitude. And so, it, you, and it's, it is, it's like one of those things where now looking back on it and reading it, I'm like, it just feels like a distant memory. All of those feelings. And I remember like we went through the 40 days and our, um, you know, I would share it with my breakout group. And at the end of it was Marion's annual training. And for those of you that are like do military um, part time, the annual training comes every year, and it's a you know at least it's a couple weeks to a month. And and his was coming up, and I told the girls I was like, "Hey guys, and we'll see if it worked. <laughs> we'll see how my heart is. We'll see if I'm actually okay with him." And you know what? It was. It was no longer was I feeling like his actions are going to either validate or tear down this, this fear of him loving me. It was not based on him anymore. The Lord had to do that in my heart. But we have to be humble and willing to let him do it. He's not going to force it. He's not going to just, you know, bring it up so that you just feel pain. We have to allow him to deal with it. And I promise you, I promise you, you're going to see fruit. You're going to. Because he is true to his word. He is true to who he is. That you will, as you hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be right with him, to be right with others, you will be satisfied. So, yeah, as we embark on it, I'm going to pray. And uh, I think the devotionals will be available in the back. Yeah, Auntie Dale, thank you. And if you want to take for yourself and for someone else that um, isn't here, or maybe those of you watching online, you can come by the church and pick it up. Or we do have an online version. You can find that on our website. So if you're better to do it online, you can find it on our website. But, but we're going to pray, all right? And so if you all could just bow your heads.
and focus your heart on the Father. One thing I want to encourage you to do, if you're not already doing it, is to just fold your hands together, like interlock your fingers as you're focusing on the Lord. And I heard this from Pastor Mark Morimoto from one of our sister churches, and he said, you know, this is, a, this is more, uh, this is symbolic, not just, you know, we don't fold our hands just because it's to, you know, have self-control. It really is, it's a picture of us communing with the Father. that kind of closeness. And just like when Pastor Daniel spoke on Akahai, on kindness of the Aloha Spirit way, I want you to ask the Father to show you what are ways that he's been kind to you. Lord, from that place, you've been so kind to us. You've been kind to us when we've not been kind to you. And from that place, you may be calling each person here to be able to walk, to walk out of their strongholds, of the shame, the guilt, the hopelessness, the areas in their lives where they thought, I'm gonna take this to the grave. People will just have to endure this in me. But Lord, you see more. You see beyond what they see. And so Lord, I pray I just ask God for your grace. Your grace gives us courage. Your grace gives us strength. Your grace allows us to feel secure. So Lord, I pray that you would pour your love and your grace upon each person. And if for you, just between you and God, if you want to, you're gonna just make that commitment that on Wednesday, you're gonna commit to doing the 40 days. Again, this isn't for us. This is for you, between you and God, to make a commitment to persevere, to push through the hard times, to push through the pain so that you will see victory and you will see healing. And if you wanna do that, I wanna just go ahead and raise your hand as a sign to the Lord, God, I'm gonna commit, I'm gonna do this. I'm tired, I'm tired of living with the strongholds. I'm tired of being tripped up, I'm tired of the anxiety. I'm tired of living in fear. Amen, all right, you can put your hands down. So Lord, we just pray, God, we just declare right now that in the heavenlies, you have already paid the price for breakthrough. And so Lord, release that now over every person. In Jesus' name, we just pray for breakthrough, that you, God, are the God who burst through. You are Baal Perazim. You burst through in these areas that we feel are unchangeable. So release that now over every person. I pray all this. Bless each person, God. I pray that your grace would follow them, God, all throughout this day. That you would renew our minds, renew our thoughts. 
to be in line with yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Daniel. All right, so some closing thoughts. Uh, again, the 40-day devotional. Can we give a hand for cars here? This is awesome. <clears throat> again, one of the ways that you know things are legit is when family is all about it, right? And so when she showed me the 40-day devotional, I took it and I shared it with my kids. Um, uh, uh, Caleb, Alexa, and I did the last, the last round of Accelerate. We did the 40-day treatment together. Um, and so we met together every week, and we just shared what's, what's, our, what's, our, what's our journey, you know. And Alexa worked on selfishness. Caleb worked on pride. I worked on inadequacy. And we just worked together, and we went through the 40-day devotional, and we loved it. It was amazing. And so don't forget about that. But if you do, you can go online, and you can get it for yourself. Um, this is the main key though. What is it that you're going to be breaking? What stronghold are you gonna be breaking? Because I don't want you to get, this is not a typical 40 day fast. This is a 40 day treatment. You hear what I'm saying? There's a difference between fasting and getting set free. This is not about fasting. This is about getting set free. So don't fall into this traditional mindset of fast. I, I, I love the Jesus fast. I love doing, you know, she's joking about the, the vegetarian diet. I loved it. I did 153 days of it, okay, one year. I loved it. It was amazing. Um, probably wasn't good on our pocketbook, but it was great. It was awesome. As great as that was, though, this has been far more effective for my life in going through it every year. And um, when we started in 2020, every year, I would do a 40-day treatment. And so it... Uh, what is it for you? It could be like Uncle Ron, shame. Maybe that's the one that God wants to set you free from. Because it's, it's not just about breaking shame. It's about being set free into the next thing. You hear what I'm saying? It's not just being getting set free from bondage. What is he, what is he positioning you into? Right? So when I first did it, my whole thing was anger. God wanted me set, to set me free from anger into what? Into the joy of the Lord. Right? So it's about getting set free into what he has for you. So maybe it's anger for you, and he wants to set you free into the joy of the Lord. Um, one year, uh, another time, I was, I was saying, I'm going to fast for my son, for my son Caleb. Uh, and, you know, it was one of those things where we, we had disconnected. And so I was like, for 40 days, I'm going to fight for my connection. And I'm not just going to fight for my connection physically with him and talking with him, but spiritually. And so for 40 days, I warred on, on, on his behalf and my behalf that we would be set free. And the next time around, he's doing the 40-day treatment. You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy how that is, right? Um, and, and then the last time around, it was um, inadequacy, like I shared, right? And I little did I know, God was positioning me in leadership positions, positions not in church, just church ministry, but marketplace ministry, governmental kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And so the Lord is positioning you if you will open your heart to say, Lord, I'm going to persevere, as Carlos is saying, through this 40-day treatment. So what's that one stronghold that God wants to set you free from? That's the first thing that you have to do if you're going to embark on this 40-day treatment. The second thing is, who are you going to partner with? Who are you going to do this with? Because I'm telling you right now, you're going to feel defeated at times in the 40 days. You're going to feel stuck. You're going to feel like, I can't do this and feel hopeless. And that's where you call upon that, that partner and say, man, I need, I need prayer. Like, I would come to Caleb. but like, Caleb, you got to pray for me. I need prayer. I'm feeling inadequate. I feel like I cannot, you know, do this. I mean, he's my son. But that's the power of the ecclesia. There is no junior Holy Spirit. Amen? Right? And so I'm telling you guys, I just want to infuse you with hope. Find out their stronghold. Partner with someone and keep cracking at it for 40 days and you will be set free. Amen? All right, so I want you all to stand. We're gonna close out in prayer here. And uh, this is gonna be, this is gonna be powerful for us as MGMC. All right, and especially for those of you who are gonna take the Ecclesi Accelerator, you're gonna be doing this for more than 40 days. You're starting on Wednesday, right, for 40 days, but then when you take the Ecclesi Accelerator, you're gonna do an additional or maybe a combination of 40 days. And I tell you, there's going to be breakthrough upon breakthrough upon breakthrough. And so um, I'm really excited about that. Before I pray, though, closing announcements. I always forget this. What is it? Tithes and offerings. 
So come forward for tithes and offerings and then chairs. Okay, thank you. So if we all could just help out, put away chairs, that's great. And then parents, go and pick up your kids right away after this. When you pick them up, you can let them run in the parking lot, but that doesn't mean you don't have to watch them. You need to watch your kids. Okay, you are still accountable to that. All right, but if you want to hang on a talk story, that's totally fine. Whether it's in the parking lot or in the chapel, that's totally fine. Okay, but just remember, ties and offerings up front. Uh, put away your chairs, and, uh, and we can, you can do that after we're done praying here. So let's close out in prayer. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the, the, the encouragement, the hope that was released through your daughter today, through this message. And I thank you, Lord God, for Ed Savoso in writing this book of 40 Day Treatment and getting set free from strongholds so that we don't have to stay stuck in it and we don't have to pass on these strongholds to the generational line, but we can cut it off and stop it and we can set ourselves free and actually make new connections of blessing for generations to come because of these 40 day treatments. And so Lord, I just thank you, Lord God. I thank you in advance for the freedom that you're gonna set not only individual lives in being set free, but families being set free, communities being set free, our Hawaii being set free, Lord, because we believe, Lord, that you are doing a new thing, a new work in our lives right here, Lord, in the state of Hawaii, Lord. And so we bless you, Lord, and we thank you for what you are gonna do. And so, Lord, we say peace, we say blessing, and we say amen to the good work that you wanna do uh, for these 40 days and for the rest of our lives and for generations to come. And if you believe that, say amen, amen, amen. All right, God bless you guys. You have a great week. God bless.